Hello. Good evening, I guess. <laughs> Even though it's still day outside. Chantal, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you for being here with us uh, tonight at Reactor. As you already know, uh, the whole uh, discussion, the whole debate will be in English. So I hope that everyone is okay with that. Uh, my name is Petro Ionescu. I uh, work at Reactor. I'm part of the administrative board, but I'm also a, a theater director and a stage dramaturg. And tonight I will try to moderate this big talk about climate change and the discourse in performing arts. As you already know, Reactor is an independent theater and in our projects we are trying to approach uh, different uh, issues and topics, social topics mostly. And um, uh, we have this project called uh, Solastalgia, uh, which is financed by the administration of the National Cultural Fund. And uh, the project is also supported by the um, uh, City Hall of Krujnapoka. And uh, in this project, uh, we have already produced a, a theater performance about ego anxiety, and the premiere was uh, last week, and we already had a debate about this topic, about ego anxiety. Uh, and uh, today we are trying to go a bit deeper, if we can, and to see how the climate change discourse is uh, articulated in performing arts, not only in Romania, which is, uh, let's say, uh, pretty new to talk about this issue in, uh, in, uh, in theater and in performing arts, but to see also um, other um, way of approaching the, uh, uh, this big theme uh, abroad. And this is why we have an international guest. We have uh, Chantal Bilodo with us on Zoom. And uh, as I was saying, it's, I think it's getting um, more and more important to address this topic. Uh, and uh, I don't know if art is the best medium to do that, but we are trying to um, have a contribution uh, uh, on this uh, uh, theme uh, as good as as much as we can and I will uh, present the the guests now as I was saying we have um, Chantal Bilodeau she's a Canadian born artist um, uh, living in USA she's a playwright she's working also in theater and on project projects that focus on um, the implications of climate change Chantal if you want to add something more. Uh, hello, thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to um, participate in this panel. Uh, yes, so I'm Chantal Bilodeau. I started as a playwright. I also run an organization called the Arts and Climate Initiative. And um, I am calling today from Alaska. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have uh, Ivana Hogman. She's a playwright and uh, the author of um, the performance that I was uh, uh, talking about uh, earlier, Habituare, which premiered uh, last week. She wrote the text. Um, Ivana, if you want to add something. It's, uh, yeah, it's open. Hello. Um, I feel a bit uh, weird as uh, I would be in a performance which I'm not uh, used to be anymore. But I'm very happy we have this dialogue uh, tonight. And uh, even though I think none of us is a specialist in climate change, I think it's very important to, to find a way to talk about this in our uh, everyday life. I'm very interested uh, lately since the pandemics in uh, working with people uh, that are not artists. I, uh, I like to, to narrow the, the gap between artists and uh, the public. 
So uh, I hope uh, we will manage to have a conversation also with you tonight. And I'm very happy to meet uh, the other uh, guests. So, hello. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Ani Marinchan. Maybe you can present yeah, yourself. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, the um, invitation tonight. I also feel really um, strange in this setup. I'm not really usually used with a kind of a, like a stage or something. Uh, but I really want to uh, invite you all to like um, participate in the discussion. We also have a, like uh, an interactive, more more interactive uh, part. I really hope that it will be more like an informal way to approach it. And uh, yes, so I'm uh, an activist in daily life, uh, environmental activist. I'm part of a gas activist initiative. It's an initiative that uh, fights against uh, gas infrastructure, mainly new gas inf infrastructure that is proposed. Um, but I like I have uh, more uh, like different um, hats kind of and this is the one that I'm wearing but uh, tonight maybe I will also refer to like my experience with the uh, forum theater and like performances that are like going in the streets and uh, fighting for a cause so kind of like uh, the activist and the arts uh, together okay thank you Annie uh, Wana Pushkatu, she's a, a performer and an actress. She will perform tomorrow uh, in a one woman show uh, called Vinovat. Uh, maybe you will join us, Wana, if you want to add uh, some words. Thank you, Petro. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Petro said, I'm Wana Pushkatu. Uh, it's really nice to be here in front of you. Uh, even though I am uh, pretty used to being in front of the public, it's still a very exciting day, and I have a, like a, a little bit of anxiety, but uh, it will pass, I promise. Um, I, what I want to say, what I want to add what, uh, to what Petro said is that I'm a part of... Uh, Besna Theatre, uh, a theatre collective uh, which uh, activates in both Romania and the UK. And we are a political theatre um, um, and we tackle uh, things like climate change and uh, immigration policies and uh, we do political shows. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Wana. And uh, next we have uh, Delia Gavlitsky. She's a theater director and she's also the coordinator of Mini Reactor, which is uh, a, a very important uh, uh, theater for young audience. I, I, I assume that you already know Mini Reactor, Delia. Well, actually, Mini Reactor is the platform for young audience in Reactor. And I don't know, I'm here today because uh, we thought it's, it's important to talk about how do we discuss with the youngsters about climate change and I don't know, about their future, especially. Okay, thank you, Delia. So, uh, thank you everyone again for being here. Uh, as Ivana was uh, saying uh, before, we will, we will also have uh, uh, this uh, open debate with you, but for the first part of the discussion, uh, I have some questions prepared for the guests, and also we will have a presentation uh, from uh, from Chantal, and also we will try together with Ani to talk a bit about uh, the initiatives also in in theater in Romania that uh, concerned climate change. Uh, but also the other organization, uh, organizations where Ani is uh, more expert than I am. So just to know how uh, this whole uh, debate will, uh, will be structured. Chantal, I think uh, you can have the word. We listen to you. Thank you. So... Um the question I was asked to address is what does the representation of the climate crisis look like in the performing arts? And um, I just want to preface by saying that I, my expertise is mostly with um, English speaking countries for obvious reasons. It's because that's the work I um, hear about the most and that's, these are the artists I interact with the most. 
So please um, take what I say and, um, you know, understand it in this context. There's, I'm sure there's a lot more being done that I'm not aware of. So um, what I've seen very in the last few years, I would say um, post COVID is a greater effort to engage uh, with the climate crisis in the performing arts than even just a few years ago. I started doing this work um, about 15 years ago, and at the time, I I was one of the very few. Um, I, I there was no I didn't know anyone around me who was doing this work, and um, you know through trying to make it known what I was doing, I ended up uh, meeting more artists who were doing it, and now it seems that there's been a a real um, shift in interest since. 2020. So that's um, that's a, that's really great news, and not only with artists but also with theaters, where there has been um, plays produced, of course, but also reading series and contests here and there that specifically try to encourage um, uh, playwrights writing about the climate crisis. However, within all of this, what I see a lot is um, dystopian work. So a lot of post-apocalyptic stories, um, stories about breakdown of of civilization, stories about survival, um, painting a very bleak world, essentially assuming that we failed in um, addressing the, the climate crisis. And oddly, I see this... Um, more, and I'm a little nervous about saying this, but I've, you know, this is not a scientific study, but I, t- I tend to see this um, fall along gender lines. So it, it tends to be more uh, male playwrights who go towards the apocalyptic scenarios and female playwrights are a little bit more balanced in the stories that they tell. And this, this dystopian work is... Um, you know, it's not on. It's not unique to the performing arts. It's present a lot in fiction. It's present a lot in film, and of course, it's all over the news. Um, you know, because what we hear about is always the is always our failings. So it's it's disasters, natural disasters, policy failures. So we keep being told again and again that we're failing, and that this this is represented in the in the artistic work that we do, and. Um, it's very concerning because what that tells me is that we don't have, our imagination doesn't take, take us to a different place. We can only imagine the worst, but we haven't yet um, spent a lot of time imagining what's possible that might be a livable world as opposed to an unlivable world. Um, again, in the, in the, in the recent years, um, Another thing that I've noticed is work that deals with more specific issues. So for a long time, um, artists were trying to to tackle the climate crisis as a whole. You know, what is the climate crisis? And of course, it's a very big subject to put in a play. And um, you know, it was it was, and I did that too. At at first, it was a lot about the science of it, trying to understand the science and trying to communicate the science. And now um, artists are zeroing in on more specific issues uh, that are more personal and sometimes more unique to a place. So instead of the climate crisis, it might be about um, forest fires, rebuilding after a hurricane. I saw saw a reading of a play recently that was about being an activist. What What does it mean to be an activist and to have all the weight of this issue on your shoulders? Um, another really nice play that I've read um, had a character whose only purpose, whose sole purpose, was to say goodbye to extinct species. So again, something very specific, like a, a narrow, um, narrower issue within the big issue of the climate crisis. So, and also, one thing that I've noticed, which is um, maybe not as true in other countries, but in the U.S., certainly there has been a shift away from these conversations between uh, deniers and people who believe, you know, people who believe trying to convince deniers that climate change is real. It, we seem to, even though it's that issue is still very real in the in society, in the arts, um, there's been a 
a movement forward to leave that conversation behind and, and move on to more nuanced topic. Um, I'm also noticing, especially with the younger generation, that there's a, a real effort to play with form. Um, again, in, in the U.S. and in English Canada, there's uh, the tradition of the well-made play that is still very strong. And I don't know that, you, that we can address this really complex issue, uh, you know, in this very complex world that we have today with very old structures that came down to us, you know, from 2,000 years ago. Not to say that the Aristotle cross structure is not um, useful, but it's certainly not the only way we can address the climate crisis, and maybe it's not the best way anymore. Um, there is uh, also more, while at the beginning, the performing arts were dealing with the climate crisis as a mostly strictly an environmental issue, now it's it's opened up to include climate justice. So there is uh, more understanding and there's also a very big push from the climate movement that is being reflected in the art to bring social issues, social issues together and to understand how the climate crisis and other issues like racism, uh, ec economic disparity, uh, gender discrimination, all of these things, how they affect each other and how the climate crisis is um, a big, um, I can't find the word, it, ex not excel, well, I'll, I'll use accelerator because I can't um, find a better word, but it just makes, it enhances all the, the issues that are already present, make, makes them worse. So that's being reflected in the art. Another thing that I'm seeing these days um, that I find uh, encouraging encouraging in a way is um, plays that deal with loss and plays that find that try to find resilience in community and re reconnecting with our environment and, and embracing indigenous uh, teachings so and I'm saying this is encouraging I mean it sounds very bleak but it's encouraging because um, there's a there's a recognition there's the recognition that we have to grieve we have to um, acknowledge what is being lost in order to then find the courage and, and the hope to move forward. I don't think we can leave those feelings aside. And I think it's encouraging that um, there is a, a, in a way, it's a, it's a, pu it's public grieving. It's a public ritual that helps us um, get in touch with those feelings because in our day-to-day -day lives, it's easy to leave those aside. You know, like oh no, it's too overwhelming. It's too difficult. I'm going to think about it for two minutes and then I'll, I'll move on with the rest of my life. So these plays are inviting us to acknowledge that we're, we are losing so much and that yet there's still so much that we can fight for. Um, what I'm not seeing a lot of yet, um, I know this is something, this is a big movement in the UK, but I'm not seeing it, certainly not seeing it um, a lot in North America is um, plays that are focused on solutions and um, that envision futures that are not um, dystopian and that are not utopian either. So futures that are not just sci-fi. So futures where um, I had a, an intern, a student intern um, not too long ago who wrote about films and she said it was actually very true and it was interesting to see her um, notice that. She said, I have yet to see a film where, um, you know, we succeed because we pass good policies. The most simplest things are not, um, they're not present in, in our stories. We don't tell stories of um, mixed success, which is what is going to, what is going to happen. You know, we're, we're, it's unlikely where the world is completely going to fall apart, at least not in our immediate lifetime. And it's unlikely we're going to succeed so brilliantly that, you know, everything is fine. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And those are the stories that are not being told yet. Um, and, I, and, and last thing I would like to mention is, um, again, in North America, I find that the most interesting work is being done outside of major institutions, um, big 
theaters, you know, it takes a lot of time. It's, they're big boats. It, took, it takes a lot of time to sort of stir them in a different direction. And they're also, um, they have very set systems in place and it's hard for them to stray away from that. But in small, um, small groups, you know, small theaters, um, artist groups, there's a lot of really exciting work that bypasses the traditional venues and traditional structures. So, for example, there's been um, there's a company that's been touring on bikes. They, they pack up all their sets, you know, and they move to they bike to small communities and they do their work there as a, as a way to um talk about the environment and also being very sustainable in how they do it. There's been shows in national parks, again, to engage with the issues in, of the park um, and, and, and meet audiences in a different place than where they would usually see plays. Um, there's also, I've noticed, um, groups who combine theater with a direct experience of the environment. If we're going to talk about the environment, um, we can do so, you know, in a black box, and that's one experience, but we can also do the same thing outside in the environment itself and then give audiences uh, both experiences at the same time. So they're thinking about something, but they're also in the environment where um, they can experience it. So I hope that provides, that's all I have. Um, I hope that provides some context and that's useful for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chantal. Yes, of course, while you were talking, I was thinking that there are so many levels uh, in, uh, in not only in theater production, but in everything that we can, to, can do related to climate change or how to be ecological. And it's not only the content, uh, as you were saying, about uh, those plays that uh, talk about the apocalypse or about the solutions, uh, but also in the way that we are actually doing and making our job as artists. Uh, and I was looking a bit uh, these days to see how I can um, uh, have like a, a small map about what's happening in Romania. Uh, and we don't have so many artists in theater that uh, um, are tackling uh, this issue. And maybe for the, the, the Romanian audience that is here with us tonight, I will try to, to give some examples to see where we are uh, um, uh, regarding this topic. And as I was saying, there is not very much done. And uh, one of the examples that I really find um, uh, important is uh, uh, Janina Carbunariu. She's a theater director. She's also the manager of... Um, uh, State Theater in Piatra Neamț in uh, northeast uh, Romania, and uh, she made uh, uh, in the beginning of this year a performance called Waste, but it was produced in Stuttgart. It was not a Romanian production, and uh, the topic um, uh, of this performance is about the uh, illegal uh, waste that is uh, brought uh, from uh, rich countries as uh, Germany, France, uh, Austria, and they are brought in uh, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, and they are illegally burned in uh, cement factories. So that's the the the, 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 the subject of the of this performance. But as I was saying, it was not produced in uh, in Romania. Uh, and uh, as a yeah, another example is uh, a scenographer, and she uh, is uh, working um, with an um, um, object that she recycles in her um, installations, and uh, um, she also has a platform called Charlatans where. The, uh, she is producing different objects. She's called Cristina Milia, but again, is one example, uh, from, um, uh, an isolated example. Uh, and um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a festival, a, a dance festival in Bucharest at, at Cene de Ben. The uh, how is it called in English? <laughs> the National Dance uh, Center, exactly. And they were trying to have, 
it was not a similar debate as ours, but they were inviting journalists, theater artists, uh, visual artists, uh, and um, also activists to give uh, their uh, perspectives and uh, their uh, image about what we can do. And the, the whole meeting was called uh, Ideas for Planet Earth. Uh, but this is where we are, and there are some uh, isolated performances also made in Romania. We are also uh, try to to uh, go there with uh, this new production, Habituare, where the, um, Ioana was part of the artistic team as a playwright. But there is also another one that uh, is about the illegal uh, forest cutting. Am I saying it right? Does it make sense? Uh, Verde Tayat, which is also uh, an independent uh, theater show. In the state theater, I'm not sure if there, there is much about it. You were... Uh, yeah, of course, she's here because she's a representative of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, very, very uh, small group of artists that are concerned uh, 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 about climate change. And there are also Another, uh, some other artists that we, I, I think we all know people that uh, uh, have this uh, uh, issue in their mind, but maybe it's not uh, verbally and very directly uh, articulated. My art is about uh, being ecological or how to save the planet uh, from my side as little as I can do. Uh, so, yeah, this is what's happening in Romania, and it's very new to talk about this in, in the theater, but not only. And I remember that last week when we had uh, the Q&A after the performance, I see Natalia Ciobano here with us, and she was saying that com compared to what was happening, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 or more years ago, it's very important that now we want to talk at least about it. That's a step forward to talk about it, even though we can uh, uh, change very much in, uh, on a higher level. We are not uh, able to, to change laws or to have some uh, direct and concrete um, uh, measures to, to do something about it. And I will let Ani to talk about other initiatives from the activists' part. Thank you. Uh, I actually want also to thank, um, uh, I'm really bad with names, uh, Chantal, uh, for the presentation because I think it really um, grasps a bit of also the context that I was trying to prepare to present it tonight. Like, because Romania is a really different context, like East European and more poor and all that, like all the social context affects how we actually talk about social issues. And uh, for me, the climate change, even if it's such a striking a big topic, um, in Romania, it's a bit different to approach it now. Um, and if I'm going a bit more in the back, some years ago, it was like, in Romania, it was a lot of denialism. People didn't want it to talk about climate change because they didn't believe in climate change. I think this thing is changing now, so, um, like in the mainstream, I mean, like there, there were people, of course, but like um, practically all the topic of climate change, which is such a big topic, stayed and remained on the hands of NGO people with like a really a narrow, like not narrow as a, they were doing little, it's just more that they couldn't do more because like we are all with our limits, but like all the climate change was in back in the years uh, only in the like this rational scientific data based, which is a lot of work to do. They made a lot of advocacy or tried to, to do campaigns and so on. It's an NGO based. But that really created a, um, an atmosphere in which climate change is about numbers, about rationality, about all this thing that comes with statistics and so on that says also that it's the end. And all these statistics that are uh, on top of this emotional um, fear of what this end can be and all these dystopian American movies on top, I think it really creates... Uh, an, an environment in which it's really hard to approach the subject. And I think it is indeed in the last years, from 2019, 12, 20, maybe with the pandemic even more, we tried to do in like really small, like a theater there, an initiative there. I also have this 
uh, book uh, is called um, Lumile Noastre Posibile, Our Possible Worlds. Uh, and as you said, Chantal, it's an approach of science fiction, but this one is um, initiated by queer feminists of R people from Romania, um, which were trying to not imagine a dystopian world, but more like different kinds of end of the world. Maybe it's not the end looking beyond the crisis. And the main idea of it, and I was also writing a text here, I'm making a commercial here, but I really believe in it. Um, I think that the main idea in this book is that the world that we are living now in, it's someone's dream come true. Somebody is really happy about how, it, how things are going, and it's not our dream. So we, our dream can be also possible. The thing is that it, which one is that one? And as you also sent Chantal, I also feel this uh, need now. Um, and you said that it was already there. Climate change to not be taken as a whole because it's such a big thing. I really want to see more concrete uh, understandings and debates and discussions about what actually is climate change. What actually is the trigger of that temperature rising there? What is the trigger of that and that and that? And personally, I'm looking on the gas industry and how industry and economical system works and intertwine with this kind of crisis. But I really want to approach it from a more creative way of how do we actually create spaces to discuss about this. And I think here, arts and performative performances are really, like, it's a good approach. And if, as we are from Romania, we all know about Rosha Montana campaign. Rosha Montana really, like, had a movement and on the top of the movement, Janina Carbonario came with the Rosha Montana Pelini, like it was this performance about Rosha Montana, uh, and a lot of other initiatives, like songs, everything, like all the cultural boom. It was a boom on it. And I think the context is so diffi diffi difficult now also for, for the performing arts uh, to approach this subject is because I'm really sorry to say it, but there is no climate movement in Romania. And that's exactly the, the lack. And there is no, none because as the um, art perform, like the performance cultural field tries to survive from an affectionate to an affectionate to, you know, all that thing, that's how also climate movements try to survive. NGOs trying to get funds for a one campaign on a one topic somewhere, and it becomes such an entrepreneur uh, approach to what actually is real life and social life. And that's because um, our social and economical system really puts this in a margin that we, is really hard to approach. But I'm also really, really um, optimist. Um, and I also have uh, good examples bes be besides these possible scenarios that we can imagine and put it out there as a scenario that we can reach and like create together. I was also thinking about um, what kind, like from an art, like performers, performing art, creating, creators, activists, all together. Maybe it's good to define ourselves what is the positioning of ours. Do we want to prevent something? If it's prevention, what exactly from the climate change we want to prevent? Do we want to not have gas exploitation in Black Sea, which will, might happen soon? Or do we want still a capitalist system to um, er enslave our bodies and our work and so on? Like, what exactly from the climate change we want to approach and prevent it to not grow or like redirect their... Um, its way. And when I'm saying prevention, I want to remind uh, people here in Cluj about this project that we had. It was called La Terenuri, Spatio Comune Manastur. It was a green space in Manastur neighborhood that wanted, it was threatened because it was an empty, wasted green space. People were using it for like dog uh, walking and some walk, like, yeah, nice walks in the neighborhood. Um, it was threatened with the idea of having a mall or having some building there because, you know, the city is growing in this direction, but it's not something palpable. It's not something that you really see. It's not yet the, the drill, the, like the digging uh, car there or anything. And we started this campaign about what do we want actually to have this green space for in the future. Let's create this future together. 
and that was also an art um, a cultural organization that started the project with architects, with um, artists, with people that were making the radio show of the neighborhood, with a festival of the neighborhood. And like five, six years later, we have a green space uh, taken by the city hall, and it's green. It's not the dream as we wanted, if you ask me. But I think it's the best thing that we have given the situation. It was a lot of hard work. And I want to congratulate the people that actually put all that work there and negotiated with the uh, city hall and made all that thing possible with art included. And to summarize it, coming back to performing arts, I think it's important to instrumentalize art for the cause you have and define your cause. And then maybe we can create something. Thank you, Annie. Yeah. Uh, good point, and uh, as you were saying, you have to find the the very particular thing where you can uh, um, make a discourse and to 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 really approach something because otherwise you just go all all the way. And I I think you were also mentioning about how we. Uh, exploit a bit our bodies and our work, and given the fact that we are an independent uh, theater here and uh, we are independent artists, it's even harder to, to, to try to, uh, to fight all the fights somehow uh, uh, concerning different social issues. Um, yeah, anyway, I have a lot of things to say, but I will go on because I'm not a guest here, I'm the moderator, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, yeah, I will try to go on and to, to uh, follow my structure here. And uh, one of the questions uh, that I want to ask is about writing uh, for theater. And uh, Annie was also showing you that book. But uh, is yeah, how is to write theater in this context? Because I'm thinking about the fact that the whole political, social, uh, climate uh, change context is influencing the way that we are producing art, any kind of art. And that question is maybe more directed to Ioana, uh, um, who is a playwright, and also uh, uh, to Chantal. And I am really curious about how do we shape our discourse uh, concerning climate, our artistic discourse concerning climate change. I'm saying that also because I wrote your essay, Chantal, uh, why I'm breaking up with uh, Aristotle. And there's a way of shaping things, not only the content, but also the shape of, of theater that is changing given this context. I don't know who wants to start, Chantal or Iwana, and anyone else who wants to. And Delia, of course, because she's a coordinator. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Uh, I, I just have a question first. When you um, talk about shape, you mean form or what the form of the text? Also that, but I, I'm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of... Uh, things that uh, are related to form and shape of discourse? Because I, I ask because uh, I think it's maybe funny to start like that by saying that uh, in dialogue with the director of uh, Habituation, which is uh, Raul Kolda, uh, we ended up to the conclusion that we want to go back to the more classical form of writing for theater, uh, my, myself, for the first time, I tried to write uh, a narrative, having a narrative. I tried to write uh, less uh, uh, deconstructing, uh, less fragmentary, as I would usually do. I tried to use uh, some kind of characters, even though they are not fully characters. Uh, so I wrote scenes, theater scenes, <laughs> classical theater uh, scenes. But uh, coming back to, to your question about uh, writing for theater, and I have to say uh, with the risk of disappointing some people that I come from a less uh, militant place, um, I, I, 
it's hard for me in this time of uh, life and in this time of uh, my process as an artist uh, to find uh, resources for uh, protesting to, towards anything. But I will talk about my process, why <laughs> Juana is, uh, is laughing here. She's uh, em empathetic, yes. Um, my first uh, dilemma when writing about, uh, not about climate change, because I wrote mostly about uh, solastalgia and uh, eco-anxiety, was uh, finding a place from where to write without uh, transferring uh, the paralyzation uh, par par I, I felt while researching about climate, ch climate change not transferring it uh, into my work and uh, into the public. Um, the, the main uh, dilemma was how to write without uh, being cynical, how to write without uh, pointing fingers, uh, without using blame as a tool for, uh, for saying what I want to say. Um, I wanted very much to be very proactive in my work and very warm and uh, positive as a female who writes about uh, trauma, a collective trauma. And I ended up, I think, writing uh, a warm dystopian word or something like that. Even though the scenario is not uh, dystopic, in its, dystopic in itself, the stories, uh, the performers still are a bit dystopic. And uh, coming back to this idea of writing without uh, paralyzing the audience, um, I tried to, to find um, a tool in being uh, maybe more poetical, using uh, more um, or, or writing more like I'm playing with the idea of uh, eco-anxiety than uh, trying to, to offer concrete solutions. Uh, I, I think it would be great if art would uh, get at some point where it can offer solution. I, I myself personally uh, don't, uh, cannot uh, take this position as I, I don't have solutions for myself in my life, not for everything. <laughs> I, I, I cannot, uh, I, I have to escape an eye to one. <laughs> no. Um, I don't know what else I wanted to say. Yes, and I think uh, because we were talking about this big subject of uh, climate change being uh, this alien, big uh, peripheral subject that we would like to touch, but just don't know how because it's so big and so... Uh, traumatizing for everyone to, to talk about it. I just tried to treat it like uh, something that's totally undeniable and that it's like very present, so present in our lives that uh, we don't necessarily have to call it on its name. We don't necessarily have to call it eco-anxiety or climate change. It's just present and it's just uh, manifesting in uh, a lot of ways. I, I, I'm done. Thank you, Anna. Chantal? Yes, so I've, I've written a number of work I've, uh, about, that deals with the climate crisis, and, um, and they vary from full-length plays to very short ones. And I think um, my journey has been uh, so far that at the beginning, I wrote very, I think, more directly about the climate crisis and the science and, um, yeah, about, about the, the science. And, and as I move forward, it, I tend to steer away from that a little bit and um, embrace more of the social issues and also... Um, I try to find... So I, I should say that um, I'm speaking, you know, for the most part, because I live in New York, I'm speaking to an audience that's already, um, you know, 
concerned about the climate crisis. I don't have to convince anything that it, that it's real. And so that's different than maybe playwrights who live in different parts of the country who have to um, use different tactics. I have a friend, for example, who um, she's working with, uh, she was working with television producers and film producers to encourage them to include climate related information in their work in the background. So, you know, not change anything about what the show, what the film is, but is there anything in the background that could be um, there that is just part of the story? You know, we don't bring attention to it like this is climate change, but it's just part of the story. And I feel like moving forward, um, I, I have branded myself as a climate change playwright, so I don't think that's going to change because everybody knows me as that. But it doesn't mean that everybody has to be so direct. Um, climate change is part of all of our lives. Um, we're all being affected by it. So, you know, we I, all of the stories that we've always told, um, love stories, uh, you know, family conflicts, um, internal uh, searches, all of those can still exist within the bigger context of climate change. Um, in my own work also, I what I'm trying to do, and I, I talked about this a little bit um, just earlier, is to hold two truths together. The truth of everything that we're losing and all of the sadness and the anger, you know, at the fact that things are not changing quickly enough or um, significantly enough and um, finding the, if not the hope, at least the, cor the courage to do forward, to go forward and to um, still engage because we, we have these very specific targets, you know, like we shouldn't go above 1.5 degrees of warming and, um, it, it was something I was very much focused on when I started. And now, you know, it's very unlikely we're going to meet that target. And I had to go through a real moment of, well, then what? And I have to constantly remind myself that the outcome, you know, the work is the same because we can always prevent things from getting worse. We may not meet any specific um, targets that we've set and that's, Dis disturbing, but um, you know it can always it can always be worse, and we want to do as much as we can f to stay away from the worse. Um, also, I'm I'm thinking um, again in the in the North American context. There's a the tradition of uh, plays like a lot of dysfunctional families and um, very focused on individual stories. And I'm, I'm trying to think of how can we disrupt that and recenter human beings within a much larger context. So, for example, we've only been on Earth, you know, for a fraction, uh, a really, really small time compared to the age of the Earth and, and all of the species around us. Is that a way, is there a way that that can be captured in the stories that we tell? Um, also, the, the concept of interconnectedness, um, our stories are very human centered. What does it mean if we try to break that open and put humans as one part of a big web, web of life as opposed to as the main part or the apex, you know, of all of the species? And um, I, tend to, I tend to write uh, in, in very poetic ways, like including non-humans non and animals and all kinds of other beings in my story. And I try to um, capture a sense of awe, which is something that I very much feel when I, you know, have different um, experiences with nature. I, as I mentioned, I'm in Alaska right now and I was on a, I went on a cruise, um, a day cruise where we were taken to a glacier and we saw all kinds of animals, you know, on the water. We saw otters and sea lions and whales and against this backdrop of huge mountains with snow on top and um, this glacier that was calving. And it's so um, impactful to be, you know, to feel small in such uh, huge nature. And I think if we are able to feel that, then um, 
we're going to have a different relationship to what's around us because the, we want to protect these things. We want there to be, we want them to be there for us and then for the next generations. And so what is it? I, I'm always asking myself, what is it with my plays that I can, um, how can I impart this sense of awe or, or encourage people to find it in their own lives? Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. I was picturing, you know, that very famous image where you have the pyramid with the human being it's on, that is on top, and there's another image with the circle where the human being is just somewhere in between animals, insects, uh, fish, and uh, plants, and uh, er the whole ecosystem. And you were saying about this kind of approach where you give a voice to uh, other beings or other things, not only humans. Uh, okay, maybe Delia, you would like to go on because I, I think the the whole platform of Mini Reactor and I'm thinking about the projects during the, the pandemics where uh, children were, were involved in writing uh, for theater, like small episodes, and maybe you can talk about how do we shape the discourse and how we can influence young audience. If you want, of course. Yes, of course. Well, when it comes to me as an artist, I don't think we have to be not direct. I think uh, ecology, it's a big theme, and climate change, it is important. And if we have an elephant in the room, then we are going to talk about it, not crawl next to the walls, not to disturb the elephant. And it's very important for the young audience to know that. And I, wanna sh I really want to share this experience. I used to work in Hong Kong for a while. And there I found a lot of children who had all the knowledge about ecology, even more than I had. And before uh, becoming an artist, I graduated Geography University. But it was this big gap between what they knew and what were, were they doing, how they act on it. And I realized then that this is a huge issue about climate change being so mainstream and have it all around education, in education, but not being able really to act on it. And I was wondering why is this happening? And I'm here actually to talk about values and how I truly believe that values are the core thing in um, my uh, process as an artist. And when I talk about my beliefs, I talk about mini reactors, directions as well. And actually, today I realized that our first show in Mini Reactor was an ecological one. <laughs> we were talking about two old men being in the garden, in a garden, and we were giving kids to eat uh, radish and apples and fruits in inside the show. Um, and since then, I had this this belief that everything I do in the theater, it has to be somehow related to um, climate change and to love of nature. And I believe that the values that I believe that they are healthy, there's, there is where we have to start, like tolerance, love, listening skills, not being inactive when we see things happening around us. And this is what we do at Mini Reactor. And in each show, you can see one of these core values that we are talking about, not only for the children, but for the parents. And what was uh, Petra talking about, it's... Um, we have the series of uh, film theater during the um, 
isolation period in pandemics. And we encourage children to write about uh, how, they, how they are living this uh, lockdown. And we created 12 episodes. You can see them on our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, I think they are great. Actually, it was Petra's idea. <laughs> all this, all the projects she wrote it, she got the funding <laughs> we just implemented. And it was really hard. Really hard because we were thinking, how can we create 12 setups, but not use the materials for 12 shows. How can we do that? I mean, it was so much effort to do it. And from my point of view, the stories were really, really relevant, not the costumes, the never-ending costumes that we could use. And we tried to, to keep it quite simple and to value more the words and the ideas and the, the emotions that were coming out of those words. Thank you, Delia. I wasn't planning to go there <laughs> where I was writing the project and everything, but yeah. Uh, Wana, maybe you can talk a bit about... Uh, um, Besna Theater, and only, not, not only, but uh, I think you have a whole, how do you say, demers in English? Approach? Oh, again, approach. Uh. Well, uh, yeah, so I will talk on behalf of Besna Company. Um, um, talking about Vinovata, this uh, show about climate change, uh, it was very important for us to uh, to make sure that we highlight the responsibility of, uh, the responsibility of individuals and uh, and uh, uh, and the complicity they have in the climate change um, but most importantly we wanted to hold a great uh, companies accountable, uh, the great polluters and uh, the companies that benefit more from uh, from the climate crisis, and we want which are the oil companies, and that's why we have that list uh, in the middle of the show. Uh, I think it's important to uh, show people that we. I mean, we know who is to blame for this and we know what we have to do to, to change. So that's why we're, we're trying to make people aware that you can change something. You just have to, uh, to know about it. And I think theater is a very uh, important tool to do that because it raises empathy in the, in the public. And um, it, being empathic makes you to take action. Um, a huge aspect of our work is uh, empowering audiences and uh, giving them this tool of empathy and also uh, giving them um, some sort of knowledge, but not statistic one, because when we were writing Vinovata, I mean, not myself, but uh, Sinziana Kozokarescu and Niko Vakari, the two directors and the founders of Besna Theatre, um, while we were uh, talking about this um, this dis this uh, discourse discourse of climate change, I was expecting a lot of statistics and uh, their approach to be like one where uh, to tell people what to do to not to uh, climate change not to happen, uh, but uh, they said that, and I agree with them now. Uh, to make people aware, it's more important than giving them just numbers because you can find numbers anywhere if you get interested by the subject. Uh, so, yeah, we are trying to create a sense of community around uh, every subject that we, uh, we uh, tackle and to create this feeling of empowerment in the public. Thank you. I, I think you are really mixing the activism with art Yes, because uh, uh, ourselves as a company, we uh, 
we name uh, we name ourselves like an interventionist political theater company. I mean, we are very militant and we try to, I mean, this is our way to do our best, <laughs> I think. I was thinking about that and this is somehow related to my next question because uh, having like uh, this different hats as Annie was saying, you know, being an activist but also being an artist, also being uh, a human being in this context, having a personal life, a family, uh, any kind of family. And I'm thinking that um, going there, fighting also for this kind of causes, it's so time consuming and energy consuming because you're not doing only art. You are also struggling yeah. for a lot of stuff. Yes, and uh, that's why uh, in everything that uh, Besna does, they have like a very uh, long time of uh, research and development of the of the text, and um, well, because we want to to be aware of everything that is happened, and we are trying to find p to put the pieces together to find really who is responsible and what can be done. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have something more there? <laughs> I don't know. Is this the second? Uh, the second? Uh, no, I'm no, going. No. The, I, I was uh, <laughs> uh, looking at Ani because I, yeah. I'm trying to uh, open up a bit uh, and to to go there, where uh, I, I want to 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 talk more about how does our work, since you are not an artist per se, but you worked in different contexts, in cultural and artistic contexts. And I, I'm curious, and this is also related to Delia because on on, on the values that she was talk, uh, talking about, and the way we, the, the work that we do reflects some of our values va values and the way that we want to live. And I think it's also similar to what Besna Theater does, because we 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 do want to add uh, in in our specific kind of work the way that we want to shape the, this world or our little world or the, the small community that we are in. So maybe you will ask, answer again uh, this question, Ani. Um, yeah, so like, I'm not really sure if I will reply directly to your question, but like, uh, I have some thoughts around this. Um, I think I really want to welcome a bit into the conversation this kind of like need of warm community feeling. Um, because as I said, the context here is a bit different. We didn't have that time to have a public debate, understanding like the deep understanding of how the system creates the, the climate change and climate crisis. And to even allow ourselves to call it crisis, um, is still a debate in uh, in our context. So, I, because of this lack of uh, time um, and like the foreign um, um, influences and foreign also like we are really in contact with everything happens everywhere. I think it's just like um, too much to handle. Um, and I want to welcome this kind of like nuances and different positions while we are all together. We can be emotional about it and we can talk about emo those emotions and we can be militant about it and we can talk about the numbers and scientific stuff, but we can also envision other words based on those scientific stuff. So when I'm like a bit more militant and you hear me more militant, I don't want to get people out of their bed that they, they need to stay there and they need to, you know, find that warm besides their home and families and friends. I want them to know that we are allies in this um, while we are facing this together. And uh, in, a, in Romanian context, for me, like I, I have these two hats. Sometimes I'm deep anxiety in my home and my friends know uh, how much I want to go to my garden, garden at ho or countryside. But I also, I am also a militant because I know those numbers. I have a deep analysis of how that uh, slogan that it's everywhere and not really too much in Romania, system change, not climate change, is not from anywhere. It's real. The system that we have, it's um, from the, how the economy works, 
how the power is distributed to the, through the society, how the money are distributed to the society, how the gender are uh, like diff, um, inequalities through gender, through racial um, inequalities and so on. So there are like so many layers and if we don't understand how this interacts with the climate crisis, which is a symptom of that system, uh, it's harder to approach. And uh, when we talk about values and so on, like I feel like we, ha we really have to think as artists and performers and so on to write down our theory of change. I've seen this in many uh, groups, more activists to be honest than um, uh, artists, to write down theory of change and really try to apply it in your work. And theory of change meaning which are your values, how do you get there, how that world full of your values looks like, and how you create that theater play into a, uh, is it the room of a theater? Then maybe, maybe you will have to change your, um, uh, your tools, your um, approaches according to that theory of change. You might want to go to schools if kids will not come here anymore or, you know, it really depends on how, what do you want to prioritize and where do you want to position yourself. But I think that without this taking a clear stance, which is political, in my opinion, it's really hard to talk about it because climate change is deeply political. Thank you, Ani. Yeah, I do agree that climate change is super political. <laughs> but on the other hand, I believe it's common sense. And the guilty in the climate change, it is the system, but in the same time, we are the system. And this is where I think that I can have a bit, tiny bit of the power. And you were asking about how can we shape our small communities. This is something where I feel that I have a little bit of power and it makes me feel good about it and positive because I, I, I saw some of the kids and parents growing in mini reactors shows and I can see there is a bit of hope because this small community that comes uh, in this small yard it is a bit different and they are really listening. I have this memory when it was uh, winter time and it was a little bit of snow outside on the times when, where we had snow. <laughs> and the, the kids were playing and it was a poop, a dog poop in the snow. And my face went black, green, yellow. Oh my God, what the parents are gonna say. And then I see the father, he goes to the trash, picks up a bag, takes the poop, puts the poops in the bin bag, in the trash can, and then uh, tells the kids, go on and play. And then I realize, wow, these are the people that I wanna share my, my my, my shows and the dialogue because we can really have a discussion. And more of that with our kids, that they may take the example of us and the parents. And yeah, maybe there is hope, but the communities are super small and it's super exhausting from my point of view. Yeah, I agree. It's not uh, an easy work. I was saying it's very time and energy consuming. You cannot do this only if you really have a, a very, very big drive to do it. Otherwise, you can do art for art and that's it. Wana, you wanted to add something about this uh, or not? No? I was thinking that before you... Okay, no. I, I don't know if anyone else wa <laughs> wants to add something. Chantal, would you like to add something on this topic or... Yeah, I just want to add um, something briefly um, about system change and responsibility and how, you know, individuals, we have a little bit of power. I keep thinking about the early lockdowns um, for COVID and how 
I mean, I was blown away. Who would have imagined that you can stop the world, right? From one day to the next, you can stop the world. And we could all agree. I mean, there was nothing, well, in certain countries there were, but in most countries, you know, it was an agreement that we all made that we needed to stay inside and be safe and uh, protect each other. Now, there was a huge crisis that happened to everyone at the same time, and the consequences were very real because we were seeing people die everywhere. But I keep thinking, if we can rally everyone around that, like it's possible, right? Until COVID, I think we were under the impression that, yes, we need this thing to happen, but we're never going to be able to rally everyone around this idea. But we did it. We were able to do it around COVID. And so I keep thinking, what is it going to take for us to rally around this idea in a, in a big way, you know, to make big changes very quickly? Um, so it's, I don't have to answer. It's just a question that's out there. But I think it's an interesting um example of what we're able to do as a world community. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I remember that sometimes there's... Um, we had uh, um, in the past some uh, Q&As after some theater performances, and sometimes there, there was this kind of question. Uh, but why don't you talk about this? Or why don't you talk about that as well? I mean, everybody uh, identifies a social issue or a very, very problematic topic, and uh, they pass this responsibility to the artist. Why don't you talk about this as well in your theater uh, performances? And I'm thinking that it's sometimes so much pressure on us to also be aware of what's happening and also to follow somehow your your job and your work. And there's another thing about theater that uh, keeps uh, bugging me. And I remember that a couple of months ago, uh, we had also a, a very interesting talk with two of the members of Gob Squad, um, a German-English company, theater company. And we were talking about how necessary and... Uh, how much can theater do? And one of them said, well, financially speaking, theater is a disaster because it's consuming a lot of money regarding production. And this is one of my questions related to ecolo e ecology. How can we be sustainable in theater? Or how do we talk about theater production giving uh, the fact that we are consuming more stuff in order to create uh, scenography or to have certain lights that are uh, costing a lot of money to heat this, uh, these big uh, uh, studios that we have and stuff like that. And I'm wondering, uh, and, and I was very curious uh, how the things went uh, for your production, for Vinovata, Wana. Did you talk about this? Was that an issue? How much plastic do we use? How much light do we consume to, to make the performance look in a certain way? Uh, yeah, we had these talks with the, with the uh, scenography, with uh, Gabi Albo, the, uh, the, design, uh, called the designer. Um, but uh, at some point, we thought because it's a it's a play about climate crisis, we should uh, maybe use uh, candles, and then we thought about the uh, uh, bee wax uh, that was wasted, and then yeah, we had these uh, these um, these talks, but. Um, talking about stage, uh, um, stage sustain, uh, theater production sustainability, um, we started to see this happening in the UK at first for us as a company. Um, uh, a shift towards sustainability in theater productions, uh, which is slowly becoming. Uh, having an, an impact also to the small companies that they don't have enough budget, but it's becoming um, more easy for small companies to access this type of uh, theater production. Um, 
in in our work in the UK, we are really trying to work with set designers and costume designers that are actively doing uh, this type of work, like working with uh, sustainable materials and uh, trying to reduce waste. Um, but and we are uh, we are learning from each project to another, and we are uh, getting what we learn to the next project. Um, we are trying to be as effective as possible uh, while reducing waste. I mean, this can be very uh, time-consuming and uh, money-consuming and uh, incredibly challenging, but I think, um, um, especially when we are working in condition of precarity, because as small companies, we don't have as much money uh, to put in the shows, but it is by no means impossible. Um, talking about Vinovat, uh, which uh, I, Chantal, I have to say to you, Vinovat uh, means guilty. Uh, guilty is, um, is a genderless word in English, but here in Romania we don't have this uh, genderless word, and so we put the masculine and the feminine. That is why it's called Vinovat. Uh, uh, is for the feminine. Um, we are using, uh, maybe we, when you will come to the show tomorrow, if you haven't seen the show already, you will see that we are using water. And we felt that um, uh, using water is very important because we wanted to highlight that uh, the, the importance of water and how the, the war on water will become the next oil wars, because that's what we think is going to happen uh, in the future. Um, hopefully the use of water will create, we are hoping that this use of water will create uh, uh, a uh, feeling of unease in the audience and make them reflect about how, um, how important water is, uh, especially sweet water that we drink, that we consume, and uh, the enormous impact that uh, water waste have and fossil fuels have. Um, I'm, I'm talking about here, about the uh, big companies that use it and uh, their, uh, all the resources worldwide that are uh, affecting less fortunate people. Uh, so yeah, that's why we we are using we got this uh, question about why do we why in a in a theater play about theater show about uh, climate crisis we are using water. It's it's to put an awareness about this. Um, in the in the grand s scheme of things, the liters of water that we use uh, are nothing compared to to uh, to what the major companies are doing. So, as a metaphor, uh, we thought it was very powerful, this use of water. Yeah, I was not judging. I know that you ah, no. use uh, <laughs> water. But, I, yeah, I, I think it's... At some point, when you are very deep in this topic, you start to see uh, and to be attentive to everything around you, and you, 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 there's this... As you say, start, you start to feel uncomfortable because maybe you can really reduce everything very, very much. And in comparison to what Pieter does in some cases, and when you see how much waste there is, I, I'm really starting to, to ask myself how can we produce theater in, in a more ecological way. I don't know, Chantal, what, uh, what, what's your experience on this? How do you feel about it? So I'm not an expert in sustainability, but there are a number of organizations that are doing um, incredible work uh, trying to green the cultural sector. Um, in the UK, there's Julie's Bicycle, and they've, they've created a whole series of tools for um, organizations to measure their carbon footprint, and then they have recommendations on how they can lower their carbon footprint. There's also um, something called uh, Creative Carbon Scotland that's doing the same thing in Scotland. Uh, in Canada, the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts um, has is in the process of adapting these green tools that Julie's Bicycle uses and um, uh, creating adapting it for the Canadian context. And so um, 
these are all, you know, in a way, and sustainability is easier. And I'm just saying that because it's measurable. It's not, you know, content is much harder because you don't, you don't really see the impact right away. It's hard to measure the impact. With sustainability, you can change a light and immediately know how much less power you're using, or you can um, ban all the plastic water bottles from your theater, um, or you can use more sustainable wood to build your set. So the, I'm not saying it's easy to implement because um, as um, it was mentioned, it's costly, it takes time, there's all these other measures, but um, it looks it looks good for funding, you know, because you if if a funder gives you money, you can say, okay, here's what I've managed to achieve in terms of sustainability. And I would also say that it's it's important, um, even though the theater as a whole is a small sector, and you know the changes are small, I guess, in the in the big um, context, it's important that we do it um, just because it's important as a as a sector that we do our part. But also theater is rehearsal for life, right? We put on stage things that we want to implement in our in our life. So I think it's a good model to um, model sustainability and to even to say it um, I'm a little sad that sometimes uh, theaters will go through a lot of efforts, but then they don't talk about it. The audience doesn't know. And I think it's important to say, like, here's what we're trying to do. Here's um, what we're achieving. Here's where we're not able to make that much changes because it, sh it shows that there's an effort and it shows that it's not straightforward, that you can make some things better, but you have to compromise. And I think it's a it's a good model because then people can maybe go go home and be inspired to do whatever they can do in their life. Thanks. Yeah. I just add, like I totally agree with you both. Uh, three people that already talked on on this, but like what I would like to um, add about this exactly system change is more like maybe in this uh, type of uh, exercise that we want, like rehearsal for life or how you want to call it in like. Uh, how do you how would we approach the changes in our daily um, life and circuits of life? See where actually system doesn't support you. Where do you recycle in Cluj? Where do you like on what is based this energy? Maybe it's already like on gas or petrol or you know. So and that's not something that you can change. And maybe being aware of that and like see w what. Um, initiatives from like climate movement as small as they are but like there is I don't know some NGOs also that are making advocacy also initiatives that are appearing and I'm really hopeful that it will be a boom in the next years um, to like really connect with those and say okay we, we can't do much about this because it's part of the system of city hall and put the pressure there together with the, the other actors of like social life. Because if we want each of us to just recycle at home in silence, nothing will happen because when the garbage car is coming, they are putting all together because they don't have a system to recycle. So I know it's like kind of, uh, especially the recycling uh, topic, it's so much talked about and nothing act upon that we almost don't want to talk about this bagatellized kind of a topic that you don't want to hear about anymore. But I think we really have to put the responsibility not only as on us as individuals and groups. To, we can do something to feel better and to see that you, we, we contribute to the change we want to, to see in the world and also to be aligned with our own values. But we really have to align those values on a more social level and really p point out the actors that are responsible for that change to really happen at the system level also. Because otherwise we'll be just, you know, the, the recycling at home until the street. Yeah, meanwhile we can educate ourselves to be good citizens, right? And uh, this goes to Delia because she's in the educational approach as well. Maybe you want to say something about it. I'm not sure. Well, I don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> No. Well, no, I think that we, it's very important to be aware of capitalism and that, yes, we recycle, but why do we buy? How much do I need to buy? And all this stuff. 
And yes, now we know how to recycle, because as far as I know, all these recycled bins, they were not implemented into a system because we didn't know how to do it. Now we know it, so we can ask uh, for the system to be implemented because now have, we have the power to do it. Like the bins are full with <laughs> recycled materials all over Cluj. So now we have it. We've obeyed the system. So let's change it. I don't know. But there are those uh, big cans where you can put the recycled materials, right? But you're saying that everything goes to. Yes, they do. Okay. As yeah. far as I know, they were created like this, uh, but not having a system yet, because um, they decided that we, as citizens, we don't have the, the means, and uh, we don't know how to do it. So we needed a time to learn how to put our trash separately, and now I think it's the time to do it, like to implement the system. Mm -hmm. I did it, I knew it, and I did it because I wanted for other people to see me how I go with free baskets <laughs> downstairs. Yeah, your own example, right? Yeah, I think this is my only power because I'm afraid of going in at the big battle. <laughs> but Annie does, so... What I can do, I can go with her and be a follower. This is what we all can do. I like how this is going outside the theater world. And maybe that would be a good uh, time to open up the discussion. I still have questions, but I want to uh, open up and to see if there are any questions from the audience regarding everything that we talked so far. There's, oh, okay, so there's a microphone for you. Hi, um, so my name is Marius. Um, I'm, um, I would say I'm a city, concerned citizen involved in sustainability. Um, so my, my question, I'm, I'm stuck with the beginning of your presentation where you were talking about this difference between uh, doomsday and then kind of like more positive outcomes and dreaming and imagining uh, solutions. And um, looking at different types of arts, um, I see poetry as being like the forerunner for expressing more positive solutions. Like um, from the art that I consume, uh, poetry has been the first to, to move away from, from doomsday and kind of start to imagine things. Uh, the best example I can give you is like All We Can Save Anthology. It's uh, an American bestseller, New York Times bestseller book. Um, I, I recommend it. Um, and my question is, like, in the different types of arts, because you, you also touched on the idea of Hollywood um, preferring uh, collapse as it's more friendly for the big screen. Uh, or more, it brings in more um, audiences. Uh, what is the delay with, between the different types of arts, and, and how does theater um, sit in, in, in the spectrum? Like if, if maybe poetry, in my perception, is a forerunner, uh, how long does it take for, for, for theater to, to, to start to include this? I'm not very familiar with, with how, how the whole process works, but for me, classic, cl I feel like literature, it's easier, you just write the book, so it kind of starts earlier. And then you get more funds, and then maybe you do a, a play or a movie about it. So my question is, uh, if you feel like there's this delay because of production costs, and what are like other arts that you're looking at for inspiration that could help you uh, put something in, in, into your work? This question, look, it's question, an open uh, question. Uh, it's an open question, okay. Yeah. Chantal, did you have, heard, have you heard the question? Um, some of it, but not all. 
Can can you just rephrase? Like, what is the the question itself? Oh, I cannot do it. Sorry. So uh, no, it's it's the, because of the camera. Uh, it's not uh, the way you talked. It's not about that. The volume was good. Uh, so I will try to reformulate or to uh, uh, yeah to say the question again. So what's the delay? between arts and especially about theater uh, regarding uh, those topics. And um, you know, Marius was talking about how poetry and literature are maybe more update and uh, there's an, an another way of consuming this type of art and maybe theater because of the cost of, cost of production and uh, the, the efforts to do a, a theater piece. Is uh, it's it's maybe why it has a certain delay. I, I more or less. Yeah. Okay. So and the next question is, uh, as theater artists, uh, if uh, we look at other types of art, and uh, for inspiration. Mm. The question is for everybody, Chantal, it's not only so. Iwana, she's trying to answer. So as, as far as I know, as a consumer, uh, maybe the, the sector that has the most uh, or, or managed to, to explore uh, the most in this uh, direction are the visual arts. And I'm talking here about uh, visual, uh, both as digital art, as painting, but mostly I think as installations. Um, and I think this, uh, somehow, it's, it's true for Romania also, not only for, for the outside. Um, I, I, now that you uh, asked this, I'm very curious maybe to, to understand why. Why, why are they uh, somehow maybe um, more, uh, or went Further, yeah, further, that's the word I was looking for. Went further than we, we did. It's maybe the type of, uh, of tools that you find to express. And this is my, maybe my, uh, my feeling as a writer that some, sometime I would find it more valid to express what I want to say in a visual way, but I don't have, uh, I'm not prepared for this. So I will stay sad in my writing and think a oh, visual artist would do it better. But if you ask like my my main inspiration in these years for uh, engaging in a type of discourse was uh, Olafur uh, Eliasson. I think he is the best for me as an inspiration, and I think in his works, uh, even if he is a visual artist. He uh, uses this tool of presence in a very nice way that I think it would be so much uh, so so much better to to manage to find this this way of expressing uh, a discourse about climate change in theater also the the concreteness of the things that they are very real they are very here with us and the fact that uh, we are present here because his installations are very participative in, in, in many ways. Yeah, I think. Someone else that would like to answer? Well, I do it as well. My next project is going to be uh, in collaboration with a poet. She doesn't write especially about climate change, but we are going to work together and yes as i'm i don't know made as an artist i will try to keep it as echo as i can do it in a state theater <laughs> so i think we we all look around because theater is a mix of art but i think you pointed perfectly why theater is some steps backwards Um, I, I don't know 
because I'm not aware of all the data, and that's why I'm saying this. I don't know where theater is positioned in the spectrum of arts, talking about climate change and how uh, theater is positioned toward this, not talking about a catastrophe that the climate change uh, will bring, but talking about perspective of uh, hope, hopeness, is, yeah, hope, 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 perspective of hope. Um, but um, I think that for Romania, it's a very new topic, uh, which was introduced um, a few years ago. Because when you are talking about all the arts, I mean, Chantal here uh, has been written climate change plays for 15 years. I don't know about poetry because I don't have the data. But I think it's important in the future for all the arts and not only the arts to do their job and to to bring awareness and to make people uh, understand what is happening and to change. In, here in Romania, uh, talking about theater, as you can see here, because you are at an independent theater, uh, this uh, this topic is a very specific specific one for independent companies. Uh, the state theater is not talking about this because it, right now, the the large public is not really impressed by this theme, and I think it's uh, it's important to to uh, to keep on working and to because uh, right now I think that independent theater are doing the work that uh, the big theaters should do here in Romania, at least. Chantal, maybe you would like to answer? Yeah, um, from my point of view, uh, too, it has been the visual arts that have been first in um, tackling this topic. And uh, for the same reasons that were mentioned, I think, you know, the, it, the, maybe the climate crisis lends itself to be um, more understandable through visuals because um, it's immediate. But one thing I wanted to add for literature and the theater, um, there's a, it's not just the artists, there's like systemic issues. There's a wonderful book by Amitav Ghosh called The Great Derangement. And he talks about um, how novels have not been so successful at um, engaging with the climate crisis. And one thing that he says is that any, and I think this is changing again, but um, books, you know, novels, fiction that engage with the, the crisis was not uh, considered li literature. It would be, you know, put into a genre like it's science fiction or, and it was not reviewed um, positively, you know, critics were putting it down. And so it has like even though the artist might might be trying to address this topic, if the wider system around the art is putting it down, then it becomes very difficult. And I would say the same has been true with um, the theater where artists are more and more engaged, especially the, not the younger generation, because they have, they've never known the world without cl the climate crisis. But um, if the critics are consistently reviewing these play negatively, then it makes the theaters shy to, to produce them. Um, and there's a whole, and I think this, it sounds like the same is true in Romania too, there's a whole um, financial aspect to this where if the theaters are not able to bring the audiences in, then it becomes more financially risky to produce these plays. Not to mention that um, there might be all kinds of reasons why they can't get them funded. Uh, for example, if they have people on their board who um, are have close connections to the fossil fuels industry. So um, I guess I just want to point this out to... So, so it's the responsibility is not solely on the artist. Like there's, there's the whole system around the artist that also makes it difficult. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, so we have one question there, and then Natalia. Okay. I guess it kind of follows on from what Chantal was just saying, um, but maybe reframed positively. Um, and maybe continuing the focus on this, as you said at the start, this idea of 
showing positive, potential positive futures like the solar punk movement does visually um, and inspiring eco action. Um, sure, when the system kind of works against you, that's difficult, but there's a room full of people here that care about the climate crisis and probably want to support you, support this movement, support this art. What do you, the panel, struggle with? What do you need? What would help you? How could we help you? Chantal, did you hear the, the question? So what do we struggle with? And then I'm not sure of the rest. What do we need and how uh, they can help us? But the, of course, I, I'm imagining that the, the question is open for everybody, right? Ani. Uh, it's not a, like absolute response, but the first thing that came into my mind, um, create more spaces to debate. At least for the Romanian context, we need it. Just create more spaces. We will try to join. And if there will be more and more groups, then we can see what further. But if everything it goes to the digs directly, these five people that are here just because it happened to, the, to them to the create one space, uh, it's a lot for these five people. So you don't help us, we help each other. I wasn't going to mention it, but it's too direct. Uh, I'm working on this right now. We're uh, organizing an eco festival that is absolutely a space for everybody to not just debate, but to discuss solutions and what we're working on and how we're acting in any way on the sustainability crisis right now. So everyone's invited. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Delia? I think cultural mediation, it's uh, a way of discussing with the, with the audience. And I think being part of it and um, I don't know, bringing more people to talk about it. If you have uh, kids, bring them here. If you have friends, send them here. <laughs> and this is how you can help. And I think it's, it's a great question. And it's really good for us to know what we need uh, to ask for people who want to help and be part of it. Because you asked about what do we need, and it's very nice. This is happening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really, it's it's uh, almost a shock. Um, I want to to talk about um, because you mentioned debate and everything. I want to talk about this uh, event that's going on this month at uh, Reactor, which is called uh, Framework Solastalgia where we, we meet and talk about um, shows we've seen here uh, related both to climate change but also to other issues as uh, depression and anxiety in general. And I happen to, to moderate this for the first time. And what I can say is that, uh, again, I insist on uh, narrowing this gap between the public and the artists. It's very important for, for us to understand what from what we do is, is, is going there in the public. It's important not to remain in our uh, bubbles of uh, art <laughs> and stuff. And I think it's also uh, because we had this process where we had uh, Natalia and Marius as uh, specialists, but also uh, a psychotherapist from uh, Minta Forte. I think it's, it's crucial, this dialogue uh, between uh, disciplines now. So um, I, I just, like my next uh, question is like, how, how can we have more dialogues like this? Where we are not each, each of us in our bubble, but also uh, we are in dialogue with the public, but also with scientists, with uh, anthropologists and people from uh, any other medium. Okay. Wana or Chantal, would you like to answer? I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay. I don't know either uh because you have all the problem what that do that what that I mean, yeah, that's what I would say. Maybe you just start 
Yes, I don't have anything to add, just to uh, underline the thing that you should bring more people to this theater, to, yeah, to, to events that are talking about uh, the climate change, then they are talking about uh, depression. And I mean, yeah, that, let's keep the dialogue going. That's what's important. Yeah, I will just want to add something because uh, of course I, I find it also very nice that you ask this question. It's very kind. And I'm thinking about this uh, two years and a half uh, with the pandemics where we couldn't have audience in this studio and uh, sometimes what we need is the fact that we are relevant somehow uh, because we know that art cannot change the world but at least we can have a space to reflect upon different issues. And I think we, we need to know that, that we can give this kind of space. And uh, during the pandemics, we felt a bit pointless and irrelevant. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a good question. We need to know that we exist and we are important for uh, some kind of audience. Natalia, you had a question. <coughs> Thank you. So I'm Natalia. Um, my question is to each of you, the six of you, um, but also to each of us when we go back home to reflect upon. And it is about the dialogue and about the discourse and how we talk to ourselves and to each other on this topic. So the question is this. If we were to replace the following words crisis, fighting, militant, protesting. You get the point. What would you replace it with in the discourse, in the dialogue? I am a specialist in this domain because Joanna thinks that it's important. <laughs> Chantal, did you hear the question? Yes, it's yes. How would we replace the words um, in the discourse, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Who would like to? I give just an received the microphone. I, I, I'm still. Maybe yeah, I can try to answer because I, I uh, started by saying I'm not in coming from a militant place right now. And I, I want to say uh, something about. Uh, which I already told you and Marius uh, a few days ago, that it was such a relief for me uh, that two, two specialists in uh, ecology, I mean, Marius is not, <laughs> <laughs> he, he is a kind of specialist, um, were, were so uh, engaged in, uh, in having a dialogue about relations and about community and about uh, finding a softer place from where to speak. I remember something you said, Natalia, uh, when I asked you uh, in the very beginning of the process, what do you think people don't want to hear or, or don't need to hear right now? And you said, uh, I think they don't need to hear about saving the world, if I remember well. And uh, that was um, a very crucial moment for me also when you talked about uh, palliative care, and this is maybe uh, a word I would try to, to replace, uh, care and palliative care, because I know Annie is also concerned about uh, grieving, how can we grieve as a community, so I don't know if I should add something more. Uh, I don't know what's the, the antonym, uh, I, I don't even think antonym is the word in English. It is? Okay. So, so I don't know what is the antonym for, for blaming and from, from guilt. I personally, uh, w without uh, trying to in in invalidate other uh, approaches, I personally found myself uh, all this time believing this is not a proactive place to talk about climate change. So I, I'm trying to find uh, an antonym to it. And I don't know what is the, does anyone know what is the antonym? 
to guilty? Yes. Accountability. Accountability. So I, I would say that the antonym for guilt is accountability and the reason is that uh, guilt is like uh, someone like be, being with you behind your shoulder telling you that you, you're okay, you have an, an, ethic, an ethical base and then you can, you can do that, that act, you can act like that. But then it can also come back because you know that you have it and you feel like you're a decent being because guilt is with you. While when you are accountable, you just acknowledge the fact that you did that, either that it was buying a plastic bottle because you were fucking thirsty, pardon my French, or because you smoke again, even though you want to quit smoking. And then you're just accountable, and then you embrace yourself as a, an imperfect human being, and then you go on with your life. And maybe tomorrow you really quit smoking, and maybe tomorrow you really take your... A, a metal container with you and you don't buy that plastic bottle and then it's fine, right? Even if the day after tomorrow you might buy a plastic bottle and then it, it's, that is also fine. Thank you. And to that I will just add uh, maybe um, engagement. Uh, and I, I, by this, I, I'm very general in, in cause, in values. But I think um, mostly for me, like the, the approach now to uh, everything that I do, it's relational. And this is where I find some, some kind of hope to, to keep believing theater has, uh, has a meaning in this world. Uh, well, <laughs> I, um, I don't know how to begin. Let me f think. I think it's important when we speak to each other to not use, to not blame each other for this because we are individuals and, um, it's important to keep the dialogue going, but when we are looking, and I know words are very powerful and they mean different things even though uh, in the dictionary might sound like the same, uh, they have the same definition. But talking about um, the great corporations and uh, the things that we are not responsible, are not somehow direct responsible, but they are making uh, these they are taking these decisions and they are uh, they are doing so without being having any concern about this uh, problem i think it's important to uh, to use the right words and to, because the right words to describe them uh, can under, ten, can make people understand uh, the importance of stuff. It's the same thing with, with climate change. You know, you said climate crisis. You can use climate change. We just talked outside about this. Uh, at first, it was called um, glo global warming. And people were like, ah, listen, we still have winter. It's cold outside. It's not, the, it's not happening. And they change it because of that. So that was a very mellow term to use. Uh, and people were like, uh, come on, it's not that bad. And I understand that we need to bring positive thoughts in this uh, aspect of this theme. And I really appreciate it. And that's why we are here to talk about what can be done. Uh, but I think it's important to also use the right words when it comes about accountability. <laughs> yeah, that is it. We have the mic. Uh, my word is accountability. <laughs> and my friends can, can find it in my sentence all along these days. 
And I don't know, I don't really have an issue if we burn the planet, but let's be aware of what we're doing. Let's be aware when we buy the plastic bottle, when we take the car, and when we do everything we do. Let's take responsibility for everything we do. Because this is who, who we are. We are not perfect. But if this is who we, who we are, then it's okay. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I feel myself in this absolute ridiculous place that I'm going outside running, but I'm taking the elevator to go to the first floor. I have Chantelle, do you want to speak? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. And I would add um, one more word, which is adaptation. And I mean that um, both in terms of our values, you know, what, are, what, what do we need to change? And also, like, physically, how do we need to adapt? And um, we are, I think sometimes the word adaptation is seen as a... Um, losing, losing the battle, right? If we lose, we have to adapt. But I see it as something uh, proactive, like humans have adapted over the course of our, you know, of our lives. Um, and we were much more um, adaptable because we because we didn't have permanent dwellings, you know, for all kinds of reasons. And since we've created these big cities and all these permanent settlements, um, we're a lot less adaptable. And I wonder if we can recapture that, you know, how, how can we be more fluid and move with what happens as opposed to saying, no, I'm here, I'm staying here, nothing is going to move me. Um, and then in terms of values, it's, um, again, embracing that we can change and it doesn't have to be a loss necessarily, you know, some things we can do differently and um, it's not, you know, that we're diminishing our standard of living or it's not that we don't have as much freedom or, but it's, it's um, how can we see that as a, maybe an expression of respect for our environment or for each other and an expression of our own resilience? You know, we, we, can, we can change with the times. Um, and, and yeah, and see that as, a, as something positive positive and hopeful. Uh, yeah, I, I have your thoughts, but I, I think I will still think about it uh, more at home too. Um, but my, my first things, um, I remember these questions that every time people are putting to me, um, but aren't you violent when you are protesting? If you are against violence, aren't you violent? And I, I always say, Maybe not exactly with these words, but now these are coming. Um, I am not guilty for wearing a skirt. Meaning the violence is somewhere else and you just point it to something that is making you uncomfortable due to a bigger discourse. I'm not afraid of strong... Uh, words like protest and militant and so on, I can see how they can be charged with something that makes people uncomfortable, but we have to figure it out that who we are addressing to. I'm not addressing towards you, change now, uh, be vegan, uh, do that, go plastic, do recycle. I don't think that that's the kind of activism that I want to see. I'm sure people are into that also when they got piled up with all this injustice that they start to see. But I think that's a phase. And, as a, and I'm now talking about Romanian context. I, I, I used to live in Iceland for two years and a half, and I've seen this difference really, really striking. People in Romania, not, I don't want to generalize, but here I feel it more strong, take p things really personal. If I'm saying something to you really convinced, you feel you are, you are like told off as your parent grow you until then. If I'm something strong, for example, happens to me as Annie, I'm like, so I'm talking like this. You know why? 
because as a woman, I was never listened. And I had to like put myself straight, speak really clear. And then people think I'm fighting with them. No, I'm angry at the system. I'm trying to explain something maybe. And I want to find this space to not correct each other's emotions. Please be less furious because angriness is not nice. Anger, it's something on top of a sadness. It's something on top of something that I leave. So I'm not sure I want to change words. Maybe I want to understand them better. And because you are talking about grief, in relation with climate change and with any other big topics, we have different approaches in different moments. As I said earlier, I can be sad or I can be militant or I can be militant in the way of like, I know what I want from this world. I want to see it together. Let's put, let's construct. I'm, I'm always changing the, the, the words that I'm using. But I also want to grief together because I feel as you were, someone was saying that the climate change is the elephant in the room, I want to take that elephant and stay t at a talk with it and say, okay, where are you coming from? What's your history? Who creates those legs you have that you are still walking around? This is my approach of grieving. But I also have approaches of making a bocitoire, how to say that in English? <laughs> a mourner, yeah. Like a, a crying song at a funeral for the land. I encourage you to organize one and I will come. <laughs> I have some lyrics already. But I also think... Um, It's a constant relation with death. And people know that from morning, but morning it's already late for grieving. And some people might feel themselves there because they feel that it's the end. But for me, it's a relation with death as present, as with someone that has cancer, and you have to go through that together. And you know that that cancer is there and might be too late, but you still hope. That's an exercise that you do every day, and you might have anger, and you want to protest against the social, like health system, and the person will take that you are angry at them, but that you are not angry at them, you are angry at the doctor that just shout at you that he has cancer. So like, there are a lot of emotions in place, and I don't want to replace words, because they have a meaning, and I'm not scared of all those shapes we can have, but I agree that if we want to maybe not put guilt, but accountability, I agree with that. Because uh, you don't want to blame people as like death, like you are the guilty one for the rest of your life. You are talking about uh, behaviors, not as a humans as per se. Even like the CEO of Transgaz, which, by the way, I kind of hate. Um, I'm sure he's a human being and he might change his mind and I am totally hope for that, but until then I will make a protest in, in front of his company shortly. Uh, these are my first thoughts. I might have more, but yeah, good question. Thank you. Nice, nice. I, uh, I, I also agree with uh, what Ani said, that we shouldn't avoid certain words and I also think that you could can be kind and caring and to take action in the same time and be firm is that a word to be firm to be yeah yeah and to to uh, not to fight maybe because it has this violent connotation but to make your point really clear yeah I just want to, to, to say that uh, I don't think uh, Natalia's exercise was an invitation to avoidance. I think it shouldn't be taken that way. And I also don't... Uh, 
like uh, because I feel I honestly feel very lonely here. <laughs> because I, I, I feel I'm, I'm the only one who is not. <laughs> Juana is here. She is saving me all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one who, who does not have this discourse of uh, protest, <laughs> militantism, or so. <laughs> no, no. I just want. Uh, yeah, I just. Yeah, maybe it's it's a good time to acknowledge that each of the approaches is uh, a valid one. And and yeah, maybe we should not uh, segregate. Is this a word? <laughs> this, this much on words. No, I, I totally understand, and I I I. I I really got this, uh, uh, and I, I think it's impossible to be in a permanent fight, protest, struggle, etc. And all those strong words, it's, it's very, no, it, it, it's impossible. I, I don't think that anyone is like that all the time. It, it, you, you will be burned, your head will be burned <laughs> totally if you would be like that all the time. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. So I, I would like to say that I'm extremely happy to be here tonight because I wrote like a ton of notes and I feel like I want to talk a lot. Okay. But I will try to summarize what I've noted and to formulate also a question. Because uh, I somehow I'm in the space of seeing you and saying, hey, but we all have space here and we're all needed here somehow. Like our approach is so unique that, I mean, why, why, why do we feel like labeling like uh, our consumption habits or our sexuality? And now we're also labeling the way we approach sustainability. We don't need to do that, any of that. And related to that, um, I would like to call a play that I recently saw at the National Theater that was called the Cese Cine Linea Occupata. Why is the line busy? And uh, for everyone to understand... It's don't keep the line busy anymore. Okay, don't keep the line busy anymore. Thank you. And the screenwriter is a young one. Is like from, the new, let's say, the new generation. And I was very happy to see such a topic at the National Theatre. And I would just want to say that it is possible. I'm using my, my time to say this, okay? Because there were like, there were still like a couple of sexist jokes or stupid jokes that, I'm sorry for labeling it stupid, that people were laughing at. And the audience was like, also, they needed to like to cling the audience on such kind of humoristic approach. So that is still needed but it is possible to introduce such to topics. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that working around the system that we are also building and not against it might work in the arts, okay? And then the question that I also had in my personal professional approach, because I somehow also am trying to work related to the topic, was one point when I was collaborating in, on as a, vo as a volunteer on illustration with an NGO that was declared to be for the fight against plastic. And then when I saw a post on their social media for promoting um, an Inditex company for their sustainable line, I was like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you talk about buying secondhand clothing and uh, the way you, you wash and so on and so forth, other solutions? And then I retired I, I exited the collaboration because I got extremely angry at their approach and I, I considered their gesture as greenwashing and I didn't understand why they would do that because they were an NGO. They, they chose to exist for the topic. I, I hope you understand the dilemma. I mean, they, they really chose to, to create that NGO. And then the question is, where do you put the line as a creator, in this case, arts creator, between uh, associating yourself with someone from the so-called 
system or that has also, let's say, good and bad decisions? And where do you put the line of, okay, is that a washed decision or is that a fair decision? And am I associ associating myself with that? Thank you so much. Chantal, uh, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Who would like to answer? I, for me, to be honest, I'm very... Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I should still consider myself an uh, emergent artist or I, I pass that phase, whatever. Um, but I, I, I was never in, a, in the place to do that. Um, actually, I was in the place to do that. But then the job was taken away from me without me having to quit on the job. But I, if I have collaborations that I don't uh, know, the, the parts that are uh, maybe the financial uh, sponsors, I, I do a bit of research. And then, yes, I, I, I would do the same as you did, I think. But also, I, I think it's, it's a very, very uh, thin line because sometimes it is masked as, I don't know, where are you? <laughs> as you said, sometimes people present as something else and they, then they take a decision about that doesn't make sense with their approach and this happens and I don't know if you can stay clean all the time, I, I doubt. Anyone else? Um, well, I want to... I mean, I totally agree with what you said. We, when we were making Vinovata, um, we were thinking, well, what would happen if like, a big company would pay us to go and uh, do, the, do the show there? for their employees or something? And we were like, no, we are going to... Um, to be uh, like true to what we are doing and we are not going to accept that and that is something like yeah I, I agree with what you did and I understand f the point w from that you made and uh, uh, from where you're coming but I wanted to tackle this from another point of view a little bit um, I am an artist at the State Theatre I'm an employee of the State Theatre in Bucharest at a small theatre. And I also work in the State Theatre and I also do my work in, uh, in independent companies and in independent theatre. Um, and it depends on the decision when you are having an NGO and you are talking about plastic free and you are promoting like something like this. I totally agree. But we are, when we are talking about individuals, I want to tackle what you said before. Like, um, I still am, am not able to quit uh, smoking. And yeah, it, it's a struggle, and, but we have to be aware. I mean, what I, I love what I do in the State Theatre. Uh, it hurts me that the State Theatre doesn't tackle the themes that the independent theatre does. But I need State Theatre to be alive. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I just wanted to add this more because I remembered a discussion we had with uh, on some other artists in the uh, residency last year. Uh, this is also discussion if, uh, if your work, uh, because someone, uh, yeah, you said about this uh, hypothetical situation where a company invites you to, to play, there is also this question of uh, if my work has an impact, what's the most important? Is uh, still being aligned to my values or uh, trying to make that impact happen? And I think this is a very personal decision and maybe it's a different one in different contexts. And in this uh, situation, I, I cannot say that I would choose the value all the time, honestly. Okay. Um. Just, yes, yeah. uh, and I th uh, also think uh, that maybe it has uh, even more value to 
uh, go and do the play for a company that uh, uh, it's at, at the uh, opposite side of what you're uh, about. So maybe go and play it for Shell. Because if you're, if you're just playing for people who have the same values as you, uh, maybe you're... Uh, I mean, you could do a bigger impact on the, on the enemy's territory, maybe. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but uh, it really depends on the context. Of course, of course. Um, I uh, saw what time is it, uh, and I think we might uh, have uh, uh, passed a bit the, 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 um, the hours that we uh, wanted to have for this conversation. I don't know, Chantal, if you want to answer the last question. And maybe we will have a conclusion and a closure. I don't have anything um, different. I, you know, nobody. I've never been so lucky as have uh, somebody offer me a lot of money and for me to have to decide whether I should take it or not. <laughs> um, and my answer would probably as nuance would be as nuanced as um, you know everybody else on the panel. Um, and also, I think we we can't kid ourselves. I mean, the money we do receive comes from fossil fuels anyway. If not directly, then it's indirect because the government is invested in fossil fuels. Foundations are invested in fossil fuels. So um, we're not, our hands are not completely cleaned either. Uh, would you like to have a conclusion now or maybe you have some final thoughts about this whole debate? I think we will end it pretty soon. I just thought this was a, an extremely um, rich conversation um, and it, it exemplified that there's no one thing that everybody should do. You know, it's all about individual um, efforts and actions and working in community. And I, I really thank you for inviting me. I have, um, I'm getting a lot out of this, and um, it was a pleasure to be in, in conversation with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you also for being here with us tonight. Um, who else would like to add something at the end of this debate? I don't know. Any I, kind of conclusion? I, I just, my, my conclusion is that uh, we should do something <laughs> together. <laughs> like a party. Like no, like <clears throat> I would be curious what type of um, product product <laughs> would uh, would take out of um, these different approaches to to the same subject that I, I felt this uh, evening sometimes uh, collapsed <laughs> into each other without us wanting to to happen, but this happens uh, ext uh, oh, mostly on strong feelings, and uh, yeah, I, I would just. Uh, let this out. <laughs> yeah, like maybe in the same uh, direction, I'm really curious how to hold space for differences because we are so different all and that's totally fine. Um, yeah. Well, I totally agree with that. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and for uh, Reactor to invite me here. Uh, and uh, for the discussion and what I would like to say is um, just keep the dialogue going that's all and uh, let us know what you said before yeah the dates and yeah everything <laughs> thank you well in the means of theater for young audience um, I think changes already started to happen worldwide and ACITEJ, it's an international association that they already have a, a theater ecology festival for young audience. And I think we can just take the examples and try to implement. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, just say a couple of words and that's it. Uh, and of course, thank you everyone for being with, this, with uh, us tonight. And I would like to invite you tomorrow uh, evening to the performance where uh, Wana is going to perform and 
is at uh, 8 p.m. tomorrow. So come to see this performance because it's very important. And I, uh, it happened to, to me to um, um, find out today that uh, it was probably the first performance about climate change and uh, uh, ecological disaster made in Romania. So come to see it. It was made in 2018. I, okay, yeah. And also on uh, the day after tomorrow at 11 um, a.m. in the morning, we will have the fourth uh, framework where we will discuss um, the show that Wana is presenting tomorrow in relation to a show from Rimini Protocol, which can be found online. But you can also like tell me outside that, hey, I want to come and I will send it to you. And uh, we will mostly have a discussion about uh, responsibility, taking from different perspectives and how do we feel each uh, show is uh, inviting us to, to be responsible. That's all. And Thank because you. we are promoting events, there is the Balkan Anarchist Fair, uh, book fair in the weekend at Akasa Social Space. And I also heard that the Makuma, no, if I'm not wrong, uh, was organizing something on also climate change. So. Uh, there are leaflets there in the background, so maybe people want to take them. Thank you. Okay, so there are a lot of things going on. So thank you again, and uh, if you have any more questions or, I don't know, we can uh, talk outside if you want to add something else. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.